Welcome to Sleepy Time Tales, a podcast aimed at helping you to get a good night's sleep. Do you find your mind plagued with the stresses of modern life, especially when the lights are out and you're trying to get a restful night? Does your spinning mind keep you awake? Follow my voice down the path towards a good night's rest. Listen to me tell a story that will keep your mind from wandering to your daytime problems. The ones you can't solve right now and will be easier to solve while rested. Listen to my voice and allow yourself to drift, following the twists and turns of the story, but slowly letting go and drifting into sleep. Before we get on with the show, I'd like to ask for a couple of minutes of your time and ask for some support. As always, the show is brought to you by the supporters, mostly on Patreon. I'm hearing from people all the time how valuable they find the show, and those supporters who have the means to help fund it, to keep it going, and help me to reach new audiences are very much appreciated. So if you're making use of Sleepy Time Tales regularly to help you to deal with sleeplessness, and you have the urge to support the show, and most importantly, if you have the means, please check out patreon.com slash sleepytimetales, or go to the link in the show notes or from the website to take a look at what's available. Um, for backers at various uh, various levels. Or if committing to a monthly thing seems a little bit much and you're inclined to make off a once off contribution or an occasional contribution whenever you feel like it, then you can check out buymeacoffee.com slash sleepy time tales. That's also linked in the show notes and there you can, well, buy me a coffee or, or a few without even needing to sign up for the service. I'd like to thank Sian and Ariane, who both sent some support through Palmia Coffee. Thank you very much to both of you for your uh, very kind contributions and your very kind words. But there's another way to really help Sleepy Time Tales without even needing to reach into your pocket, or at least not for money. You can reach in and take out your phone and help spread the word. If there is someone in your life who you think will benefit from listening to Sleepy Time Tales, just let them know. And if you recommend the show on social media, make sure to tag me in so that I know and I can thank you. That's at CP Time Tales on Instagram or Twitter. And of course, last but not least, I need to shout out the music, which is Sweet Night and Friends by Kumiko. Their music is available on their website at loyaltyfreakmusic.com. And if you are creating stuff as well, or have your own podcast or YouTube videos or something like that, The vast majority of their music is available for uh, completely free use as you as you like and there's some like i said some very cool stuff that will fit almost any genre so go take a look and see see if there's anything that grabs you um and that's enough of that for tonight thank you for taking the time let's get back to the show so what exactly is sleepy time tales What is it for? This strange idea, this podcast that you're supposed to fall asleep to. But lack of sleep is a health crisis in the 21st century and this is a podcast that is intended to help those that it can to get a restful night. Do you find yourself lying awake at night with your mind spinning and emotions in turmoil with anxieties of 21st century life? Do you wake up in the middle of the night and find yourself not quite able to doze back off for 3am? I'm here to help. My name is Dave, and I'm your narrator, here to help you into a restful night. Sleepy Time Tales is intended to be used as a distraction to what keeps you awake at night. Or maybe something, something more like background noise, or even just company. That's why I make these episodes quite long, so that I'm here for you, without any pressure of the end of this show coming. As far as I know, there's a couple of different ways to engage with the show. For me, I struggle to sleep, and when I listen to podcasts that um, inspired me to start this one, I need something to focus on. A story or an event, or something that lets me keep my mind on a specific point, to stop it from spinning out into stress and anxiety. To focus just enough not to resist the embrace of a night's sleep when it comes. But maybe some people need something a little bit different. Maybe it's simply just background noise, something like a white noise or the sound of the ocean or some boring dude just droning on in the background. 
But however you need to engage with the show, the important thing is that you don't try for sleep. Just keep a light mental grip on it and allow sleep to come for you. Now obviously, if all goes well, I'm hoping you're asleep before I get to the end of the episode. But it's important that you don't feel pressurized. If this is your first night and you're a new listener, this probably won't work for you on your first night. I recommend you give it a solid three nights try to just get used to the idea, to get used to my voice and my accent, or even just the oddness of listening to someone who's going to be talking to you while you sleep and you maybe not being sure if you can trust it. Also, maybe one episode isn't long enough, or maybe your problem isn't so much going to sleep. Maybe you struggle and wake up in the middle of the night. What I recommend in cases like that is uh, download a few episodes of the show, have them ready to roll, put them all in a playlist, and just start one and let it go in the course of the night. This way, if the stream is still running and you find yourself awake at 3am, you just pop your earbuds in and allow yourself to go straight back to sleep. You can even do the same if you wake up just before your alarm. I've developed a habit fairly recently of waking up like 30 or 60 minutes before my alarm goes and I do the same thing. Just pop my earbuds back in and go straight back to sleep. And I know that sounds a little bit strange. What is the point to an extra 30 minutes of sleep in the context of a sleepless night? But I can tell you now that I find, and I've had listeners who've uh, found as well, that that can be the best part of your night. But it's very important that you just try to relax. If you're new to the show and prone to late nights lying staring at the ceiling, this will probably seem strange to you. So just give it a chance. Because I'm here to work with you. To create a safe space, a cocoon in which you can curl up and allow nature to take its course. So if you're still with me, thank you for staying. If you're already asleep, we'll chat again soon. And of course, you aren't hearing me. Except maybe in a dream. A historical account of useful inventions and scientific discoveries, being a manual of instruction and entertainment by George Grant. London, Partridge and Oakey, 1852. Preface. It has been demonstrated that the desire of obtaining knowledge is one of the most natural and at the same time most ennobling attributes of the human mind. There is at the present time a great number of inquiring minds among the working classes of this kingdom, and a still greater number among the young of all classes thirsting for information, who in entering upon a course of general reading may be greatly at a loss for many things which are familiarly alluded to in ordinary conversation with which everybody is understood to be acquainted, what have people to think so, but in which, in reality, are only familiar to persons who have been living for a considerable time in intimate converse with the world. The historical account of useful inventions and discoveries in science is intended in some measure to supply such information to the anxious inquirer after knowledge. Of the numerous articles here treated of, it will be perceived that each has been traced to its origin in as lucid a style as possible, and in so doing we have endeavoured to combine instruction with amusement. As a proof of this, we need only to refer to the table of contents. Useful Inventions Printing Among the many arts and sciences cultivated in society, Some are only adapted to supply our natural wants or assist our infirmities. Some are mere instruments of luxury calculated to flatter pride, to gratify vanity, and to satisfy our desires of every description. Whilst others tend at once to secure, to accommodate, delight, and give consequence to man. Of this latter kind, printing undoubtedly stands preeminent and if viewed in its full extent, it may truly be said to possess a very considerable portion, not only of the comforts, but the conveniences and positive utilities of life. The advantages derived from this invention must be acknowledged by all. This art has proved the principal step towards civilization. By it has Christianity been propagated, 
and by its powerful means are we made acquainted with all that is useful in knowledge, in art and science. It would take the pen of an inspired writer to enumerate all the blessings which flow from it. It is a patent engine which possesses a preponderating influence over the mind of man, either for good or evil, according as it is used. As we proceed, we will have frequent occasion to express our feelings in grateful elogium when considering the benefits resulting to society from various ingenious inventions and discoveries. But when we consider the advantages derived from the typographic art, it appears like a vortex, drawing every other sensation into its deep interest and engulfing every consideration, so that we can think of nothing but printing and its extensive catalogue of benefits. This interest is wonderfully increased, whether it be viewed on account of its ingenuity, the extent of its benefits, or the benevolence of its objects. In whatever point of view we behold it, whether as a medium for giving the utmost facility to the dispatch of common concerns of life, or as affording the eager mind of the philosophic inquirer the ready means to gratify the inquisitive thirst of his knowledge. In every species of mental intelligence, the rapid facility which it affords to the multiplication of those mediums of communication, by which knowledge is promulgated in every part of the earth, we are at a loss for a term sufficiently comprehensive to express our sense of the infinite importance of those advantages which accrue to mankind from the invention of an art so replete with important consequences which we hourly perceive to emanate from typography. We need therefore scarcely offer an apology for inserting a brief history of this divine art in our pages. The earliest specimens of printing which have been discovered consist in the stamped marks on the bricks and tiles used in building the tower and city of Babel, and which may be dated as far back as 2,200 years before Christ. A number of these stamped clay materials of Babel are still preserved in antiquarian repositories. It is remarkable that they generally differ in shape and appearance, and that the letters or words which are in ancient character seem to have been stamped by the hand with movable blocks. In Trinity College, Cambridge, some curious specimens are preserved, one of which is a round piece of clay seven inches in height and three in thickness at the end, resembling a barrel, being thickest in the middle. This interesting relic, this Chaldean book, is covered entirely with lines of letters and words running from one end to the other. From its portable character it may be called a pocket volume, and one which cannot be less than 4,000 years old. It is mounted on a marble pedestal, covered with a glass case, secured by an iron bracket, and so contrived that the curious inspector may cause it to revolve on its marble base, but the greatest care is taken of this valuable relic of antiquity. It appears to have been printed by two moles, and at the middle of the circumference a small black square has been left, in case, as it is supposed, room should be required for a portion of the clay to escape in the action of compression. Next to these extremely ancient stamped bricks, in point of interest and antiquity, are specimens of the earliest engraving of letters on stone. We are informed by various historical writers that Cadmus, a Phoenician who lived 1,500 years before Christ, at a period contemporary with Moses, and who was esteemed as the boulder of the city of Thebes, was the first to taught the Greeks the use of the alphabetic symbols, an art he most likely inquired from the Hebrews. The most ancient specimen of an engraved inscription now known to be extant is the Sagean inscription, so called from having been disinterred from a promontory named Sagium, situated near the ancient city of Troy in Phrygia. It is engraved on a pillar of beautifully white marble, nine feet high, two feet broad, and eight inches thick, and which from the inscription served as the pedestal of the heathen god Hermocrates. The letters used in this inscription are the capitals of the Grecian language, the rudely cut, but read from right to left like the Hebrew. 
the specimen of engraving must be about 3,000 years old. Another not less interesting relic of the earliest age of printing is found in a Roman signet ring or stamp, approaching in character to that species of stamp now used widely by the post office on letters. This curiosity is preserved in the British Museum. It is the very earliest specimen we possess of printing, by means of ink or any similar substance. It is made of metal, a sort of Roman brass, the ground of which is covered with a green kind of verdigris rust, with which antique metals are usually covered. The letters rise flush up to the elevation of the exterior rim which surrounds it. Its dimensions are about two inches long by one inch broad. At the back of it is a small ring for the finger to promote the convenience of holding it. As no person of the name which is inscribed upon it is mentioned in Roman history, he is therefore supposed to have been a functionary of some Roman officer or private steward, and who perhaps used this stamp to save himself the trouble of writing his name. A stamp somewhat similar in the Greek character is in the possession of the Antiquarian Society of Newcastle-upon-Tyne. It will be perceived that however curious these relics of antiquity may be, they do not bear any connection with the art of printing books. The origin of this invention seems to be quite independent of a preceding knowledge of impressing by means of stamps. What is, however, worthy of remark, the art of printing books, though on a root principle, was known and in use amongst the Chinese at least 1,400 years before it was invented in Europe. The printing of the Chinese has never resembled anything of the kind in this country. From the first it has been conducted without movable types. Each page has been and continues to be a block or cut stamp, which is thus useful for only one subject, so that every book must have its own blocks. No press is used. The paper being thin when laid on the block receives the impression by being smoothed over with a brush. There is reason to infer that the art of printing, as thus practiced by the Chinese, may have originated through a knowledge of the still more ancient Chaldean mode of printing by blocks on clay. But we may expect, from the well-known ingenuity of the Chinese and their, in general, having the organ of imitation so fully developed, that they will not much longer continue this primitive method of printing, as an enterprising practical printer has emigrated, with an excellent assortment of presses, types, etc., from Edinburgh, to conduct his business in the Celestial Empire. We wish him all success. The discovery of the art of printing with movable types, which took place in the 15th century, in Germany, was considerably aided by a fashion, which had been some time prevalent, of cutting blocks of wood into pictures or representations of scenes illustrative of scriptural history and printing them on paper simply by the pressure of the hand, a brush, or cushion behind. One of the earliest of these woodcuts is still extant and represents the creation of man as detailed in the book of Genesis. In the center of the picture stands a figure intended for the divinity having the appearance of an old man with flowing garments, a venerable beard and rays proceeding from the head. On the ground before him lies a human being intended for Adam, fast asleep, and from an opening in his side is preceded the slender figure of a female, meaning Eve, who is taken by the hand of God and is apparently receiving his blessing. The execution of this and cuts of a similar nature is of the rudest description and is a striking testimony of the low scale of the art at the time. Pictures of this nature which were bound up into books nevertheless were immediate forerunners of the great invention itself. Books of prints, it will naturally be imagined, would soon be found imperfect, for want of descriptive text. This therefore urged on the great discovery. The manufacturers of the books at first cut single sentences or words and stamped them below the pictures. But this not conveying a sufficient idea of the subject represented, 
and anxiety arose to give a lengthened description on the opposite pages. This, it seems, was at length accomplished. Still the sentences were all cut in a piece, and the notion of having separate letters, so as to form words at pleasure, was unknown at that period. We will now proceed to the introduction of the modern art of printing. Ever since the typographic art has been introduced into modern Europe in its present form, the best and one of the most certain criterions, which prove the undoubted sense of our species, exists in the multiplicity of claims which have been made by several cities for the honour of affording the earliest shelter to the infancy of this art. It really appears to be a question yet undecided, to what city, individual, or even era to attribute this beneficial invention. However, there is every reason to believe that in this art, as well as in most others, the improvements which have subsequently taken place have benefited the art itself. As much as that has benefited mankind, therefore the question of its origin does not appear to us to be of so much importance. Amidst the claims of various individuals, Mr. Boza, in his Origin of Printing, says that this honour ought to be adjudged to one of the three cities of Harlem, Mainz, or Strasbourg, of which, in his opinion, the first-named city has best established her legitimate right. But it appears, to use his own words, that all those cities in a qualified sense may claim it, considering the improvements they have made upon each other. The real and original inventor of the modern art of printing, as at first used, and from whence the improved practice is descended, was one Laurentius of Harlem, who, however, proceeded no further than to cut separate wooden letters. There is every reason to believe that, at first, these wooden forms were made upon the principle of the former literarum, of the Romans. This Laurentius, it appears, made his first essay about the year 1430. He died ten years afterwards, having first printed the Horarium, the Speculum Belgicum, and two editions of Donatus. The individual on whom this history most generally places the honour of being the earliest discoverer of the art of printing by means of movable letters or types was John Gutenberg, a citizen of Mayence or Mainz, who flourished from the year 1436 to 1466 in the reign of Frederick III of Germany. The ingenious Gutenberg was born at Mayence in the beginning of the 15th century, and removed to Strasbourg about the year of 1424, or perhaps rather earlier. Here he became acquainted with the above-named Laurentius, with whom he proceeded to Harlem, and continued in the employment of Laurentius for some time. However, he returned to Strasbourg when, in 1435, he entered into partnership with Andrew Treatsman, John Ruff, and Andrew Hillman, citizens of Strasbourg, binding himself to disclose to them some important secrets by which they would make their fortunes. The workshop was in the house of Treatsman, who, dying, Gutenberg immediately sent his servant, Lawrence Bildick, to Nicholas, the brother of the deceased and requested that no person might be admitted into the workshop, lest the secret should be discovered and the form stolen. But they had already disappeared, and this fraud, as well as the claims of Nicholas Treason to succeed to his brother's share, produced a lawsuit among the surviving partners. Five witnesses were examined, and from the evidence of Gutenberg's servants, it was incontrovertibly proved that Gutenberg was the first that practiced the art of printing with movable types in Strasbourg, and that on the death of Andrew Treatson he had expressly ordered the forms to be broken up and the types dispersed, lest anyone should discover a secret. The words given in his order, which was supported by documentary evidence, were these. Go, take the component parts of the press, and pull them to pieces then no one will understand what they mean. In the same document mention is made of four forms, kept together by two screws or press spindles, and of letters and pages being cut up and destroyed. 
It has been asserted that Gutenberg stole the types from Laurentius, with which he repaired to Strasbourg and commenced business. But of this we can find no corroboration. It has also been said that upon his occasion, Gutenberg stole his own materials, but this is likewise unauthenticated. The result of this lawsuit, which occurred in 1439, was a dissolution of partnership, and Gutenberg, having exhausted his means in the effort, proceeded in 1445 to his native city of Mainz, where he resumed his typographic labours. Being ambitious of making his extraordinary invention known and of value to himself, but being at the same time deficient in the means, he opened his mind to a wealthy goldsmith and worker in precious metal named John Faust or Faust, and prevailed on him to advance large sums of money in order to make further and more complete trials of the art. Gutenberg being thus associated with Faust, the first regular printing office was begun and the business carried on in a style corresponding to the infancy of the art. After many small essays and trying the capabilities of a press and movable types, Gutenberg had the hardihood to attempt an edition of the Bible, which he succeeded in printing complete between the years 1450 and 1455. The celebrated Bible, which was the first important specimen of the art of printing, and which, judging from what it led to, we should certainly esteem as the most extraordinary and praiseworthy of human productions, was executed with cut metal tops on 637 leaves, and from a copy still in existence in the Royal Library of Berlin, some appear to have been printed on vellum. The work was printed in the Latin language. The execution of this, the first printed Bible, which has justly conferred undying honours on the illustrious Gutenberg, was most unfortunately the immediate cause of his ruin. The expenses incident to carrying on a fatiguing and elaborate process of workmanship for a period of five years, being much more considerable than were originally contemplated by Faust, he instituted a suit against the poor Gutenberg, who in consequence of the decision against him was obliged to pay interest, and also part of the capital that had been advanced. The suit was followed by dissolution of partnership, and the whole of Gutenberg's materials fell into the hands of John Faust. Besides the above-mentioned Babel, some other specimens of the work of Gutenberg have been discovered to be in existence. One in particular, which is worthy of notice, was found some years ago among a bundle of old papers in the archives of Mayence. It is an almanac for the year 1457, which served as a cover for a register of accounts for that year. This would most likely be printed towards the close of the year 1456, and may consequently be deemed the most ancient specimen of typographic printing extant, with a certain date. Antiquaries and bibliomaniacs have found considerable difficulty in ascertaining by what process Gutenberg manufactured types, but it appears to be the prevalent opinion that those of which he first used were individually cut by hand, and being all made as near a heart and thickness as possible, they were thus put together in the forms. The cutting of these types must have been a tedious as well as laborious occupation. The ingenious man, however, soon discovered the mode of casting his types by means of moulds. For without this great accessory to the art of printing, he conceived it was next to impossible to carry on his business. The art of type founding is therefore given to John Gutenberg, in which it would appear he has no competitor for the honour. But it is but justice to state that the plan of striking the moulds with punches was a subsequent invention of Peter Schroffer, his successor, who became partner with Faust, and afterwards his son-in-law. That Gutenberg was a person of refined taste in the execution of his works is sufficiently obvious to every person who has had the opportunity of seeing any of them. Adopting a very ancient custom common in the written copies of the scriptures in the missals of the church, 
He used a large ornamental letter at the commencement of books and chapters, finely embellished and surrounded with a variety of figures as in a frame. The initial letter of the first psalm thus forms a splendid specimen of the art of printing in its early progress. It is richly ornamented with foliage, flowers, a bird and a greyhound, and is still more beautiful from being printed in a pale blue colour, while the embellishments are red and of a transparent appearance. What became of Gutenberg immediately after the unsuccessful termination of his lawsuit with Faust is not well known. Like the illustrious discoverer of the great western continent, he seems to have retired almost broken-hearted from the service of an ungrateful world, and to have spent most of the remainder of his days in obscurity. It is ascertained, however, that in 1465, he received an annual pension from the Elector Adolphus, but that he only enjoyed this trifling compensation for his extraordinary invention for a period of three years, and died in February of 1468. John Faust, who, as we have seen, obtained the materials of Gutenberg, laid claim to the invention, which has been granted to him by several. Having sufficient capital at his command, he pushed the trade with great advantage to himself. In the Bibles which he printed, he frequently omitted the capital and initial letters, leaving them blank for illumination in gold or azure. This was designedly done for the purpose of imposing upon the public printed copies for manuscript transcripts. The report, which is in circulation concerning Faust, appears to come in support of this assertion. It being said he was at Paris and offering a quantity of his parables for sale as manuscript. The French, considering the number of them and also remarking the exact similarity and accuracy of them, even to a single point, concluded it was impossible for the most accurate copyist to have transcribed them so correctly. They suspected of him of necromancy and either actually indicted him or threatened to do, as a magician, and by this means obtained his secret, whence came the origin of the popular story of Dr. Faustus, his dealing with the devil and tragical death. In 1462, when Mentz was plundered and disenfranchised of its former liberties, Printing rapidly spread throughout a great part of Europe, particularly its artisans in that branch of art, settled at Harlem, Hamburg, and other places. From Harlem it travelled to Rome in 1466, when the Roman character was adopted in 1467 and soon perfected. In the reign of Henry VI, the Archbishop of Canterbury, St. Reverend Turner, Master of the Robes, and W. Caxton, merchant, to Harlem to learn the art. These individuals privately prevailed upon one Corselius, an underworkman, to come to England, and a printing press was established at Oxford. This appears in a manuscript chronicle still preserved. It informs us that the execution of the concern entrusted to Turner and Caxton cost 1,500 marks and that printing was established at Oxford before there was any printer or printing presses in France, Italy, or Spain. The University of Oxford Press was soon discovered to be too remote from the seat of government, and too great a distance from the sea. Other presses were speedily established at St. Albans and the Abbey of Westminster. In 1467, printing was established at Tours, at Ruthlingen and at Venice. And in 1469, it is likely that the same period at Paris, where several of the German printers were invited by the doctors of the Sorbonne, who established a press in that city. All important as the art of printing is acknowledged to be, yet three centuries elapsed from the date of the invention before it was perfected in many of its necessary details. At first the art was kept entirely in the hands of learned men, the greatest scholars often glorifying and affixing their names to the works as correctors of the press, and giving names to the various parts of the mechanism of the printing office, as is testified by the classical technicalities still in use among the workmen. From the great improvement of punching moulds for casting types by Schufer, as formerly mentioned, till the invention of italic letters by Aldus Minutius, 
to whom learning is much indebted. No other improvement of any consequence took place. It does not appear that mechanical ingenuity was at any time directed to the improvement of the presses or any other part of the machinery used in printing. And the consequence was that till far on in the 18th century, the clumsy presses, which were composed of wood and iron and slow and heavy in working, were allowed to screech on as they had done since the days of Gutenberg, Faust and Caxton, while the ink continued to be applied by means of two stuffed balls at a great expense of time and labour. At length an almost entire revolution was effected in the printing office, both in the appearance of the workmanship and the mechanism of the presses. About the same period the art of stereotyping was discovered, and develops a completely new feature in the history of printing. One of the chief improvements in typography was the discarding of the long S, and every description of contraction while at the same time the formation of the letters was executed with more neatness and greater regularity. Among the first improvers of the printing press, the most honourable place is due to the Earl of Stanhope, a nobleman who will be long remembered for his mechanical genius. Besides applying certain lever powers to the screw and handle of the old wooden press, by which the labour of the workman was diminished and finer work effected, he constructed a press wholly of iron, which is known by his name. Since the beginning of the present century, and more especially within the last thirty years, presses wholly of iron, on the nicest scientific principles, have been invented by men of mechanical genius, so as to simplify the process of printing in an extraordinary degree. An invention of presses composed of cylinders and wrought by steam has triumphantly crowned the improvements in this art. The alteration effected by steam power has been as great in printing presses as any branch whatever. For example, with the old wooden press, it took a man two days to complete a thousand sheets, that is printed on both sides. Whereas the London Times, by means of the steam press, completes 24,000 in one hour. Almost every newspaper in the kingdom is printed by cylinder presses, although some are worked by hand instead of steam. They are also used in other departments of the printing business. The introduction of steam presses would have been of comparatively little benefit if it had not been furthered by another invention of a very simple nature, now of great value to the printer. We here allude to the invention of the ruler for applying the ink instead of the old clumsy and inefficient balls. The roller, which is simply a composition of glue and treacle, cast upon wooden centerpieces, was invented by a journeyman printer from Edinburgh about thirty years ago, and was so much appreciated by the trade as at once to spread over the whole of Europe. Were it possible to conjure up the spirits of the illustrious Gutenberg and his contemporaries within the office of the London Times or some other large printing office, where everything is conducted with rapidity, quietness and order, John Faust might well think that the printers of the 19th century had actually consummated what he was only accused of in the 15th, completed a compact with the devil. As it would be a waste of time for us to pretend to describe the various processes and materials required in this beautiful art, as we are aware that, without actual observation, no conception can be formed. This we know from experience, and though we might, like many others, have pretended to give a description, we are perfectly aware that we would have been unintelligible to the majority of our readers, and very deservedly laughed at for our trouble by any practical printer who might happen to read our pages. As far as we have gone, however, in giving a brief historical account of the art of printing, we have no doubt it will be found correct, as have consulted the best authorities. Stereotype Stereotype, as we mentioned in the former article, was introduced about the middle of last century, and is so intimately connected with the art of printing we could not find a more appropriate place than immediately following the noble art. 
Earl Stanhope has been named as the inventor, but for this we have not sufficient authority, and it appears extremely doubtful. As stereotyping appears to have been invented simultaneously in various parts of England and Scotland, by different persons. Still, it was upwards of sixty years before it was brought to such perfection as to be applicable for any beneficial purpose. When properly made known, it was hailed with approbation by those more immediately interested, the printers and publishers. But as experience more fully developed its powers, it was found available only for particular work. For the better understanding of this art, which is comparatively little known, we will give a description of the process by which we are enabled to do by the assistance of an experienced workman. In setting the tops, they are lifted from the case one by one with the right hand, and built in a small iron form called a composing stick, held in the left hand of the compositor, who sets line after line until the stick is filled, when he empties it upon a galley, and commences again in the same manner, till he has got as much up as will make a page. This page he ties firmly up and places upon a smooth stone or cast iron table. In this manner he continues till he gets as many pages as will make a form, which consists of four, eight, twelve or more pages as the case may be. If this form is to be worked off at a press without stereotyping, the pages are all imposed in one chass and carried to press for working, and when the whole of the impression is off it is thoroughly washed and carried back to the compositor for distribution, that is, putting the types in their proper places. When these pages are to be stereotyped, they are imposed separately and carried to the stereotype foundry, where they are examined and all dirt taken from the face. They are then slightly oiled and a moulding frame put around each. The frame is filled with liquid plaster of Paris, which is well rubbed into the face of the top to expel the air. As soon as this plaster hardens, it is removed from the page and shows a complete resemblance of the page from which it is taken. The mould is put into an oven to dry, where it remains till it resembles a piece of pottery. It is then put into an iron pan, in which there is a thin plate of the same metal, called the floating plate. It also has an iron lid, which is firmly screwed down, and the hole is immersed in a pot of molten top metal, which fills the pan by means of small holes in the corners of the lid. The length of time it remains in the pot depends upon the heat of the metal, but it is generally from 10 to 15 minutes, when it is taken out and put aside to cool. On opening the pan, nothing is seen but a solid lump of metal, which, when carefully broke round the mould, a thin plate is obtained from the mass, exhibiting a perfect appearance of the page from which the mould was taken. This is called the stereotype plate, which in general is not above the eighth of an inch thick, and is printed form in the same manner as the page of types. Such is the process of stereotyping, which has become pretty general throughout the trade but is not much known to the public. Engraving On wood As we have shown in our article on printing, wood engraving was in fashion prior to the invention of printing. We are informed by Albert Dürer that engraving on wood was invented about the year 1520. He may be a good authority in some matters, but in this he has committed a mistake of nearly 100 years, seeing that there is at least an impression of one engraving on wood, the representation of the creation, which was in existence prior to 1430. It was undoubtedly a piece of rough workmanship, but what could be expected at that early period of the art? It has been, however, gradually improving ever since, and has now attained a point of excellence equal to any of the fine arts and calls forth the admiration of every lover of the beautiful. It would be invidious to select any of the numerous artists now flourishing. Perhaps it would be difficult to make a selection where so many are upon an equality, and we are of opinion they themselves are more than willing to accept the public approbation as their reward than any praise our pen could bestow.
all we can do is to recommend our readers to examine for themselves. They have abundant opportunities in the numerous illustrated publications that are daily issued from the press, and bestow that meed of praise upon the respective artists they may deem proper. The process of engraving on wood is diametrically distinct and opposite to that of engraving on copper or steel, as in the former the shades are produced by the parts of the work which are made most prominent and obtrude upon the surface of the substance, whence its chief merit has been regarded in leaving broad and well-proportioned lights. The parts to produce this effect being of necessity excavated, great art and a masterly judgment are necessary to effect this and at the same time not to weaken the substance, lest it should be injured in the pressure necessary to produce an impression. The substance usually employed for these engravings is wood of a close grain. On this account, boxwood is generally selected. The impressions are obtained from wood engravings upon exactly the same principle as are the impressions from typography, and they can also be worked off at the same time with the descriptive text. This is a superiority which Wood possesses over other engravings, and recommends itself to publishers on account of the immense savings in the expense of the double process in procuring copper plate illustrations for typographical works, and enables them to keep pace with the ruling passion of the literary era, cheap publications. On copper. The art of engraving on copper plates for impressions is alleged to have been invented by Peter Schoffer, one of the early printers and son-in-law of John Faust, about the year 1450. The honour of this invention is also claimed by a Florentine goldsmith of the name of Finguires, who dates his invention to 1540. This artist, having used liquid sulphur to take an impression of some chasing and engraving he had made, observed a blackness produced by the sulphur left in the deepest parts of his work, whence he obtained an impression on paper. but we have no hesitation in giving the preference to Schoffer, who, we have previously remarked, was of an ingenious turn, and assisted Gutenberg in producing moulds for casting his tops. In addition to which, some of the books printed by him are ornamented with head and tail pieces, with other rude attempts at engraving, and likewise, because Schoffer's claim to the honour was acknowledged before Fungueres was born. Of engraving there are various kinds. That called by connoisseurs the legitimate mode of engraving is what is termed the line or stroke mode. Numerous have been the British artists who have excelled in this style, in affording the means of multiplying our graphical productions. The next species of engraving we will notice is called the stipple or chalk style, imitations of chalk drawings. Portraits and historical pieces are executed in the style, which the celebrated Bartolozzi brought to perfection. The third species we will mention cannot properly be called engraving. This effect is produced by scraping and rubbing. This kind is called chiaro obscuro, or mezzotinto, producing prints which have the effect of Indian ink drawings. A fourth species of engraving is what is commonly used for landscapes which produces an effect like pencil watercolour drawing, which is called aqua tinta. In all of these kinds of engravings upon copper, the artists find the sulfuric acid or aquafortis a most powerful agent. Sometimes indeed it is suffered to execute the whole of the process of the graver, especially when it is called an etching. For the same reasons as those mentioned with regard to wood engravers, we shall abstain from naming any of the very eminent artists now living. We have already observed the mode of obtaining similar effects from wood and copper are opposite of each other. The manner in which impressions from wood engravings are obtained has likewise been noticed, and it remains that we observe the mode by which the impressions are obtained from copper plates. The plate is covered with appropriate ink, the surface is then carefully cleansed, leaving ink only in the excavations or lines in the copper. The plate and paper are passed through a roller press of a great power, the roller being covered with a blanket, which presses the paper into all the crevices of the plate and brings away the ink there deposited. 
on steel. For several years, steel has been used in great quantities instead of copper plates by engravers. By this fortunate application of so durable, and it may be added, so economical a material, not only has a new field been discovered, admirably suited to yield in perfection the richest and finest graphic productions which the ingenuity of modern art can accomplish, but to do so through an amazingly numerous series of impressions without perceptible deterioration. The art of engraving on iron or steel, for purposes of ornament, and even for printing in certain cases, is by no means a discovery of modern times. But the substitution of the latter for copper, which has invited the superiority of the British Buren to achievements hitherto unattempted by our artists, is entirely a modern practice. In the year 1810, Mr. Dyer, an American merchant, residing in London, obtained a patent for certain improvements in the construction and method of using plates and presses, the principle of which were communicated to him by a foreigner residing abroad. The foreigner was Mr. Jacob Perkin, an ingenious artist of New England, and whose name has become subsequently so extensively known in this country in connection with roller press printing from hardened steel plates. The plates used by Mr. Perkins were, on the average, about five-eighths of an inch thick. They were either of steel so tempered so as to admit of the operation of the engraver, or, as was more generally the case, of steel decarbonated so as to become very soft pure iron in which case, after they'd received the work on the surface, they were case-hardened by cementation. The decarbonating process was performed by enclosing the plate of the cast steel properly shaped in a cast iron box or case, fold about the plate to the thickness of about an inch with oxide of iron or rusty iron filings. In this state, the box is looted close and placed on a regular fire, where it is kept at a red heat from three to twelve days. Generally about nine days is sufficient to decarbonize a plate five-eighths of an inch thick. When the engraving or etching has been executed, the plate is superficially converted into steel by placing it in a box as before and surrounding it on all sides by powder made of equal parts of burned bones and the cinders of burned animal matter, such as old shoes or leather. In this state, the box, with its contents closely looted, must be exposed to a blood-red heat for three hours, after which it is taken out of the fire and plunged perpendicularly edgeways into cold water, which has been previously boiled, to throw off the air. By this means, the plate becomes hardened without the danger of warping or cracking. It is then tempered or let down by brightening the undersurface of the plate with a bit of stone after which it is heated by being placed upon a piece of hot iron or melted lead, until the rubbed portion acquire a pale straw colour. For this purpose, however, the patentee expressed himself in favour of a bath of oil heated to a temperature of 460 degrees, or thereabouts, of Fahrenheit scale. The plate being cooled in water and polished on the surface was ready to use. A more material peculiarity in Mr. Perkins's invention, and one which does not seem to have been approached by any preceding artist, was the contrivance of what are called indenting cylinders. These are rollers of two or three inches in diameter and made of steel, decarbonized by the process above described, so as to be very soft. In this state they are made to roll backwards and forward under a powerful pressure over the surface of one of the hardened plates until all the figures, letters, or indentations are communicated with exquisite precision and sharp relief upon the cylinder, which, being carefully hardened and tempered, becomes, by this means, fitted to communicate an impression to other plates, by an operation similar to that by which it was originally figured. It will be obvious that one advantage gained by this method must be the entire saving of the labourer and expense of recutting in every case, on different plates, ornaments, and borders, emblematical designs, etc., as these can now be impressed with little trouble on any number of plates, or in any part thereof, by the application of the cylinder. At first sight, the performance of such an operation as the one now alluded may appear difficult, 
if not impracticable. And indeed, many persons on its first announcement were disposed to doubt or deny its possibility altogether. With a proper and powerful apparatus, however, this method of transferring engravings from plates to cylinders and vice versa is every day performed with facility and success, not only in the production of banknotes, labels, etc., but in works exhibiting very elaborate engravings. And with that fascinating little um, story about engraving, I think I'm going to call it a night. If you'd like to learn more about historical inventions and discoveries, please feel free to look up in the show notes and find the original there. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of Sleepy Time Tales, the podcast designed around a bedtime story to help you to get a restful night. New episodes will be released every Sunday night to give you something fresh to help you rest in a new week but make sure to subscribe in whatever service you use so that you get your new episodes whenever they come out. A reminder that the music for tonight is Sweet Night and Friend by Kumiko. Check out more of their work on their website, which you'll find linked in the show notes. Good night, and sweet dreams. <laughs>